The beauty of anime is that we all interact with it individually. An anime or a manga that I adore, you might despise. And that's truly the best part about the human experience, is that we all get to experience it differently. However, that doesn't mean that the human experience can't be somewhat similar for two or possibly three or possibly a million people. And because of this, while we do all technically get to interact with anime and manga differently, a lot of us end up liking or disliking the same characters. And this is usually a symbol of a well-written story. If we can discern what characters we should like and what characters we shouldn't like, then clearly the stakes and circumstances and morals playing out throughout this entire story are being depicted in a way that our human brains can relate to. But because of this, some characters become massive favorites in the fan base, while others unfortunately fall to the wayside, which is good and bad, because this means that popular characters are going to get more of their story told. Kakashi and Naruto became instantly one of the most popular characters in the entire universe, and therefore the story revolved around him a large amount of the time. And while this isn't always the case, characters like Gojo, who are by far and away the fan base's number one favorite character, sometimes while they do get separate arcs explaining why the universe is the way that it is and how that ties into their story, also will disappear for almost a hundred chapters. And that's just the way it goes. Sometimes our favorite, most overrated characters take a step back from the story. But that only happens sometimes, in rare circumstances. The majority of the time, our favorite characters, our overrated characters, will get tons of screen time. However, what about characters on the opposite end of the spectrum? Characters who don't get nearly as much love as the Kakashi or Gojos of the world. Well, sometimes these characters do get to hang out, probably longer than their popularity should allow them to. But the majority of the time, these underrated characters, these characters that we may feel as though were the only ones who love, tend to get sidelined for large parts of the story. And thus, being an ardent fan of this character gets harder and harder because when was the last time we saw them? I mean, sure, they'll pop up from time to time, but they'll never get an important fight or character development or a look into their past. And that's how characters that we beloved become underrated. And unfortunately, underrated characters happen in every anime manga in existence. Whether it be their strength or their character that's underrated, at the end of the day, they're not being appreciated as much as they should be. And because of this, either they don't show up in the anime or manga as much as we would like, or nobody talks about them. And since this is such an anime and manga-wide problem, I figured today we should talk about those characters, our favorite underrated characters. Which is why today we're talking the top 10 underrated characters in anime. But before we get to ranking or explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. I can't show you my middle finger right now. I sliced the top of it off. Not like the whole top, but like enough of the top with a mandolin that it's not fun to look at. But the show goes on. And if you love the idea of the show going on, you guys are going to love my anime podcast, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And if you guys are trying to head into this fall as trippy as possible, make sure you guys check out my brand new merch store, where you can get everything from my Madara and Donzo to Itachi and Naruto political tees to Otaku's Anonymous merch and sticker packs. So, being underrated, it's kind of a wide catch-all term. In what capacity of underrating are we talking about today? Are we talking about characters whose strength is underrated, whose character development arc is underrated, whose character period is underrated? Are we talking about characters who we wish we saw more from in their anime or their manga? Well, I'm kind of gonna do all of that. See, because here's the thing about being underrated. It can come in so many different capacities, whittling ourselves down to one would be kind of difficult. Sure, I could absolutely do a list of top 10 characters whose strength is underrated, but then Saitama's on that list, and I don't think Saitama's an underrated character. I mean, he's the main character of one of the most popular manga on Earth right now, and everybody who reads the manga knows that Saitama is incredibly powerful. However, within the grand power scaling of everything, and within Saitama's own universe, he is vastly underrated. But if we just talked about characters who who didn't get enough screen time, then I think characters like Ten Ten would be on this list. And I don't think Ten Ten is underrated. We don't know enough about her to rate her properly. So at the end of the day, I'm kind of using underrated as a catch-all term, more focusing on the idea of characters who are being underrated by the fan bases that watch the anime or read the manga. In essence, this is not only a list of characters that I believe deserve more love, but it's also a list of characters that I believe are drastically underrated also in terms of strength. So I'm kind of trying to do everything. But maybe one day we'll do a video that's just talking about characters whose strength is underrated. But now that we got the rules out of the way, let's get into the list. Because coming in at number 10 in last place, is Arthur. Now, Arthur, also known as Arthur Boyle from Fire Force, is the deuteragonist of Fire Force. He's our Sasuke, our Killua, our rival against the MC. However, when it comes to lists of the greatest co-protagonists or the greatest side characters, 
Arthur's name very rarely comes up. And this isn't necessarily Arthur as a character's fault. So usually when people think of an anime rivalry, they think of two characters that are polar opposites of each other, battling it out to see whose ideology is best and who comes out as the strongest. But in Fire Force, both Shinra and Arthur are just idiots and they're lovable idiots and that's why i love the both of them and while their approaches might be slightly different neither of them are overly serious characters with the other being some goofy archetype which isn't what we're used to seeing in our anime rivalries naruto is the sun sasuke is the moon gon is the sun kilua is the moon the mcs of these shows are almost unbelievably friendly and outgoing people while their co-main protagonists are dark and dreary and more realistic and that just isn't really the case in fire force see while arthur is kind of your standard MC a little bit in that he's incredibly optimistic he's always striving to save people and Arthur is a bit more grounded he's not grounded in the ways that your standard deuteragonist are grounded well he's a bit quieter than Shinra, he's no less delusional. In fact, his entire power system revolves around him being delusional. And I think that's why he's not in the conversation of some of the greatest co-protagonists out there, is because we want realism and stoicism from our co-main protagonists as they're playing a foil to our regular main protagonists. And Arthur's entire power revolves around him convincing himself that he's a knight, and the more that he can convince himself that he's a knight, the stronger he gets. His entire power, delusion, which is actually one of the coolest powers in anime period. See, Arthur was the only child of two struggling restaurateur parents, whose restaurant subsequently burnt down. Realizing that they no longer were in a financial situation to raise a child, they abandoned Arthur and left a note that said they were on an adventure to save the world, and that while they were gone, he was king. Which was the moment that tied Arthur's power into his imagination. And while in premise that power might sound silly, Arthur, through the power of this power, has been able to contend in battle against some of the strongest people in the Fire Force universe. Arthur, through the power of of his own delusions and tons of combat experience gets so fast that he's able to react to Shinra's rapids, as well as being able to react to Sho's severed universe. And while Arthur isn't able to dodge Sho's severed universe, at least not entirely, being able to get so fast that you're able to react to the stopping of time within the entire universe strictly through your own delusions is pretty impressive. Not to mention, in a battle against a man named Dragon, Arthur was so convinced that he was King Arthur because he was battling an actual dragon that he reached the true heights of his own power, unleashing an attack so powerful it cut the earth in half. Here's the thing, the real reason that Arthur is underrated amongst Fire Force fans is because so far as the Fire Force anime currently is, Arthur hasn't really had his time to shine. However, everything that happens in the manga after where the anime currently is really shows off how incredible a character Arthur is. So if I had to make a prediction when Fire Force does finally come back out, I believe that Arthur will begin to get way more shine as the incredible protagonist that he is but for the current moment he's number 10 on our list speaking of massively underrated people because the anime hasn't gotten to the part of the manga where the character truly shines coming up at number nine we have yoroichi also known as yoroichi shihoin from bleak See, within the capacity of Bleach's anime, while Yoroichi is displayed multiple times to be powerful the majority of the time, it's just her showing off her speed or her body. And it feels as though pretty much every single fight that we ever see her get into in the anime, she's always saying that she's rusty and she's not up to par and she's always in some kind of losing situation. And because of this, while we do acknowledge Yoroichi as an incredibly powerful fighter within the capacity of Bleach, a lot of people don't truly understand just how powerful she is. And what she does get talked about a lot because she is one of the sexiest women ever drawn in anime. She should be talked about more about her abilities and less about her looks. So Yoroichi was actually born as a princess of one of the four noble clans. She was actually the princess of the Tenshi Haisoban. And it was while being a princess and playing around as a child that she met people like Kisuke. She would then go on to become the 22nd head of the Shioin clan, as well as becoming the commander in chief of the Onmitsukuda, also known as the Stealth Force. But this isn't where Yoruichi's historic rise through the ranks would end, as Yoruichi would later become the captain of the second division, which brought the Shioin clan, the Stealth Force, and the second division all together, which is technically what the head of the Shioin clan is supposed to do. And her accolades as a captain are almost second to none, because while being a captain, she helped create a ton of new and very useful techniques for Shinigami, the most important of which being Shunpo, which is an application of Hoho. Hoho is one of the four basic combat skills of the Shinigami. It's a defensive fighting style that relates to one's footwork, while Shunpo is basically Flash Step, which allows the user to move faster than the eyes can follow. Now, Yoruichi was known as the Flash Goddess, as the fastest user of Shunpo amongst all of the Gotei 13. 
Indeed. And this would make sense because she created Shunpo. But when we learn this information in the Soul Society arc when Yoroichi is coming in to save Ichigo, it appears as though to us that Yoroichi has lost her step in Shunpo as Byakuya, the person who she taught Shunpo to, was able to keep up with her. And then after that, we only see Yoroichi twice before the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Once during the Aranka arc when she shows up to beat Yami down for a little bit, but Yami and Okiora retreat before she can actually show off any real moves. And then once again in the fake Karakura Town arc when she attacks Aizen, which also doesn't really accomplish all that much. Basically, all she accomplishes by attacking Aizen is having her armor destroyed and then being defeated alongside Kisuke and Ishin. However, in either this season of Thousand Year Blood War arc or the last, Yoruichi finally gets her fight. A fight that nobody retreats from and a fight that isn't against the main bad guys, so it's kind of a setup for her to lose. See, in the waning chapters of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Yoruichi gets a battle against the Stern Raider Askin. And it's in this battle that we finally get to see Yoruichi Shunko. See, Shunko is an advanced technique that combines Hakuda with Kido. Hakuda being hand-to-hand -hand combat, and Kido being the Bleach Universe's magic. It's kind of like the Hidden Cloud Village's Nin Taijutsu, where they cloak themselves in a lightning cloak and then use Taijutsu. And Yoruichi is, is very similar to this. See, this technique has Yoruichi coating herself in lightning, except her lightning is actually just pressurized Kido. However, in Yoruichi's case, this Kido can be used to immobilize an enemy instantaneously or to fire off massive Kido blasts. And she has two moves in the Shunko, the first being Raijin Senkei, which allows her to fire a massive column of lightning at somebody. The second is a form known as Shunryo Kokubyo Senki, and this actually puts Yoruichi in a mode somewhat between her human form and her feline form, giving her paws and ears and a tail. She becomes a lightning cat girl. It's... it's a lot, but in a really really good way. However, in this mode, her Ryatsu is actually tied to her emotions, and thus it changes 48 times a second. And thus in this mode, she needs to be controlled by Kisuke Urahara. And Kisuke can actually activate her entering this mode against her will. So, none of it's great, but it is a really cool mode. Looking at it now, objectively, it's heavenly misogynistic. But Sexy lady, cat mode, powerful. God damn it, I hate being self-aware. Moving forward, because coming in at number eight, we have Rock Lee. Listen, when it comes to a universe with underrated characters, there is probably no universe with more underrated characters than Naruto. And that's because Naruto is an incredibly vast and wide universe with tons of characters, all of which who have interesting abilities and therefore have massive amounts of potential. Basically, nobody in Naruto ever gets to see the potential fulfilled to their max. The only people we ever really get that from are Sasuke, Naruto, Mike Guy, and Kakashi. People who objectively hit the peak of their power, while almost every other character has more room for improvement that they'll probably never see. However, in very few people is that more evident than Rock Lee. See, Rock Lee was essentially supposed to be Naruto 2.0 in the early days of Naruto, a character who, much like Naruto, was also born with next to nothing when it came to talent. However, he was a much worse case scenario than Naruto, as while well, Naruto was born with no family and no friends and a demon fox inside of him, Rock Lee was born without the ability to use ninjutsu or genjutsu, no ability to mold chakra whatsoever. And thus, Rock Lee, in order to become a ninja, something that he always wanted to be, had to overcome massive boundaries, which he did by training under Mike Guy and learning the Eight Gates. And while in the early days of Naruto, Rock Lee does get a couple of really good fights. In fact, I would say that some of the greatest fights in OG Naruto belong to Rock Lee, like Rock Lee versus Gara or Drunken Fist versus Kimimaru. Rock Lee always loses these fights. In fact, even in fights that Rock Lee was gonna win, like when he battled against Sasuke, the battle gets interrupted. Rock Lee almost never wins, which kind of flies directly in the face of the driving point of Naruto being that hard work can overcome everything, because hard work loses the talent in the battle against Gaara and in the battle against Kimimaru. Really, the only circumstance in which hard work overcomes everything is when it applies to Naruto, who I later found out was a reincarnation of God, had two of the most powerful parents in the history of the village, and was born with the strongest tail beast of all time. But surely, if Rock Lee got so many the greatest fights in OG Naruto, we should get at least one or two in Shippuden, right? Wrong. Gets absolutely nothing outside of filler. Sure, him and Mike Guy jump one of Naruto's clones in a filler arc, and that is a pretty cool fight, but within the capacity of canon Naruto Shippuden, Rock Lee does nothing. Which is insane when you consider the fact that Mike Guy, who Rock Lee should be close to in terms of strength, was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Madara, using the technique that he taught 
to Rock Lee. See, because here's the thing. There's never been any reason for us to believe that Rock Lee and Mike Guy have any separation between the two of them in terms of power. Well, obviously, we've never seen Rock Lee use the Eighth Gate. There's genuinely no reason for us to believe that Rock Lee can't access the Eighth Gate. I mean, sure, the highest we've ever seen Rock Lee go is the Sixth Gate, but Mike Guy is also the only person we've ever seen use the Seventh Gate. And now that Mike Guy is down and out of the running, you would assume that Rock Lee would become the front lines of Taijutsu and Konoha. And yet when Ishiki, somebody who's only vulnerable to Taijutsu, pulled up on Konoha, Rock Lee and the rest of the Konoha 12 got absolutely worked. When in actuality, if Rock Lee were to do something like opening the Eighth Gate, he would give Ishiki a good run for his money. At least he should be able to. And yet Boruto as a whole has seemed to forget that he exists. But not only just forget that he exists, but also forget that his son exists, Metal Lee. As Metal Lee might as well not exist within the manga. While characters like Shikadai, Inojin, and Chocho all play pretty vital roles in the Boruto manga. And I mean, sure, obviously we see in Art of the Last that Rock Lee has been teaching a bunch of people how to use the Eight Gates and they're known as the Suicide corpse. Oh, Nick pronounced it corpse, not core. Time to send an angry email. Don't put the P there. I won't say it. And that's pretty much all we've gotten from Rock Lee. But when you consider the fact that the person who taught Rock Lee and somebody who Rock Lee should be as strong as was Mike Guy, who was depicted to be almost as strong as Ten Tails Madara, you would assume we would get a bit more out of Rock Lee, but we don't. And thus, He's massively underrated. But speaking of fast people who are always yelling, coming up at number seven, we have Zenitsu. See, Zenitsu is a fan favorite from Demon Slayer. But Nick, if Zenitsu is a fan favorite from Demon Slayer, how is he underrated? I mean, that'd be like saying that Inosuke or Tanjiro was underrated when in actuality, they're one of the most popular anime characters in existence. Well, that's because for Zenitsu, I'm not saying that its popularity is underrated. It definitely is. And in fact, if anything, it's overrated. But for Zenitsu, his power by the fandom and by the universe as a whole is massively underrated. The reason that Zenitsu is a popular character is because a lot of people identify him as relatable. If I was put in the circumstance of needing to slay demons to stay alive, I would also be screaming and crying and begging for women to save me. And thus Zenitsu, while somewhat annoying, is supposed to be a sympathetic character. One who starts out as a coward, but slowly works up their courage throughout the arcs. And this is definitely Zenitsu's arc. See, because while technically in the anime, Zenitsu has displayed his strength a couple of times, like in his battle against the Tongue Demon or the Son of the Spider Family, or when he was able to defend three train carts by himself against the onslaught that was Enmu, or most notably when he's able to use his thunderclap and flash godspeed to speed blitz Doki, upper rank number six, Zenitsu has yet to achieve his truest form of strength in the anime. And thus a lot of anime only fans tend to look at Zenitsu as the weakest of the big four, that is Tanjiro, Nezuko, Inosuke, and Zenitsu, being somewhat of a liability as he only has one technique from thunder breathing and also needs to be asleep to battle. However, after the Swordsmith Village arc, there is a Hashira training arc, where all of the Hashira and the big four get ready for a battle in the Infinity Castle. Again, Muzan and his upper ranking demons. And in the Infinity Castle arc, Zenitsu genuinely has his most impressive moments, like taking on the new upper rank number six demon by himself, a demon who's capable of actually creating lightning, as that demon's blood demon art actually allows them to use electricity, something that Zenitsu can only emulate. And by the end of the manga, Zenitsu is one of the only people fast enough to keep up with Muzan. See, while Zenitsu might seem like a one-trick pony and a coward, that's kind of what you're supposed to believe, until eventually he comes into his own and develops to be one of the most powerful people in the entire Demon Slayer universe, a character absolutely on par with any of the Hashira that he's battling beside. And all that, mind you, within under a year of becoming a Demon Slayer. And that is just on the back of his Thunderclap and Flash, the first form of lightning breathing, and his seventh form, which is a personal creation of his own. And therefore, as it currently stands, Zenitsu is underrated. But considering the fact that it will not stay that way for long, I can't put him that high on the list. And in almost the exact same situation, we have our number six entry for this list, Maki. Maki Zenin is a grade four jujitsu sorcerer, which is not only the lowest level that you can be, but is also an incredibly low level to have as a second year in JJK High. This is made even worse by the fact that she was born into the Zenin family, one of the three noble families within JJK. And therefore she was born technically a non-censor to one of the noble families. She was treated horribly as a child. And while within the capacity of JJK's anime, we've seen some incredibly badass moments from Maki, like when she beat the stuffing out of Miwa, we haven't really seen all that Maki has to offer yet. See, Maki was born with an incredibly small amount of cursed energy, but still an amount of cursed energy. And therefore, the reason that she's able to be as strong as she is, is the lack of cursed energy she has. See, she was born with a heavenly restriction. However, because she still has a little bit of cursed energy left, she can't be as strong as she possibly could be, like Toji Fushigoro, who was born with no cursed energy and therefore could reach the height of human strength. Eventually, Maki is able to abandon what's left of her cursed energy and achieve a level of strength comparable 
comparable or greater than Toji Fushigoro's. Which leads Maki to some of the most badass and incredible battles in all of JJK. As she mops up anything or anybody who's ever crossed her. It's awesome to watch. However, even in the manga, now that she is one of the most powerful people that the good guys have to fight for them, it feels as though she's been somewhat forgot. Sure, right now in the manga, there's a battle between the two most powerful entities that the world has ever seen, and thus anybody but the two of them interjecting is probably out of the question. It feels as though, currently, that there isn't really a person for Maki to battle against. Almost as though her story is done. Which doesn't feel correct when we consider the fact that we've spent all this time comparing her to Toji Fushiguro, who is hailed as one of the most powerful people in JJK's history. A perfect example of how powerful Heavenly Restriction can be, which Maki is now the representation of. And considering the fact that Toji was able to jump a non-perfected Gojo, you would assume that she would be able to, if she has power comparable or greater than Toji Fushiguro, battle against some high-level threats. And yet when her and Yuji had a short little battle against Sukuna, it felt as though that she really wasn't carrying her weight. Well, I mean, she does pull her weight, but she shows up for one chapter of a battle, and then that's the last that we see of her. Well, technically, Sukuna does acknowledge that she is the more powerful between Yuji and her. I like being shown, not told. And thus, Maki, though it absolutely could change, is underrated in my eyes. But once again, we're keeping her kind of low on the list, because at one point in the manga, she'll probably get a very important fight that'll depict the fact that she is incredibly powerful and truly worthy of being connected to Toji. I mean, you could actually very much already argue that she is worthy of being connected to Toji. I mean... I'm not gonna spoil it, but ugh. but I want more. She's my favorite character. Speaking of people with bad fathers who love swords, coming up at number five, we have Boji. Nick, what do you mean? Boji is one of the most beloved MCs of 2022. How can he be underrated? One, because I believe Boji needs to be in the conversation of one of the greatest MCs of all time. And two, because I believe Boji's strength is massively underrated. See, Boji, for those of you who don't know, is the main protagonist of Ranking of Kings. He's the crown prince of the Boss Kingdom, and therefore he's the son of King Boss. However, while Boss was a giant adventurer who traveled across lands defeating powerful enemies, at one point he found himself not strong enough to battle against some enemies. And thus he made a promise with a demon, promising that demon all of the strength and power of his firstborn child. And in exchange for the power and strength of his firstborn child, Boss's power would multiply many times over. But because of this, Boji was born small and weak and deaf. Boji would then go on to lose the one person who doted on him like he wasn't a boy born for the most powerful man on earth with no particular abilities, his mother, Sheena. When an ally of Boss Moranjo staged a coup against the kingdom of Boss that failed in everything except for killing Sheena, Boji's mother. Now, Boss would go on to remarry. Marry a woman by the name of Hilling, who would have a child, Dida, who would get Boss's powers. And thus, Boji, the firstborn son of the kingdom of Boss, was the disappointment. However, that never stopped Boji from living an incredibly joyful life. While Boji was viewed as an outcast and a mark against Boss's name, Boji was a joyful child who loved everything and everybody around him. And while I believe that Boji is a much better example of telling the story that you can become more than the circumstance of your birth than people like Naruto or other people who try to expel those ideals, there's also so much more to Boji's character that make him one of the greatest main characters of all time. Like the fact that he's one of the only and greatest representations of a character with disabilities in anime. And it's not like he ever overcomes his disabilities. He learns to live with them. He learns to embrace them. The people around him learn to live with them and embrace them. And more than anything, they learn to love him for the person that he is. But more than that, because of the curse laid on Boji, he can never become stronger. And therefore, in order to overcome the weakness that was inflicted upon him by the demon's curse, and Boji becomes faster when he masters his swordsmanship, wielding a tiny rapier because anything heavier than that, he wouldn't be able to lift. Therefore, Boji increases his speed to a blinding level. And learns how to identify weak points so he can strike those points exactly and use his small, fragile body and his small, fragile rapier to bring down even the biggest and baddest of opponents. As Boji is able to overcome the strength of his father, once regarded as the strongest man in the world, as well as being able to battle Oaken, a mad immortal, to a standstill multiple times over. While Boji is a popular character, I don't believe he's talked about enough. As not only a powerful character, but also as an important symbol of representation within anime, but also also as a character who lives up to ideals espoused by Naruto and Luffy and Ichigo and other optimistic Nepo babies much better than those optimistic Nepo babies. As Boji, legitimately born with a curse on him to make sure he was weak, was able to identify ways in which he could get stronger and capitalize on those. Therefore, while Boji is popular, I believe he deserves to be one of the most popular protagonists of all time. And so he's sitting directly in the middle of our list. But enough about popular characters who I believe should be more popular. Let's get to some characters who legitimately should be popular, but just straight up aren't. Because coming in at number four, we have 
Tokuyami. Fumikage Tokuyami is from My Hero Academia. He's a member of Class 1A. A lot of you might know him as the one with a bird head. See, Tokuyami's existence in Class 1A has always been a bit weird. Because here's the thing, Class 1A is kind of a smattering of usefulness and absolute uselessness. While we have people like Mineta, Naval Laser, who never do anything important because their quirks are just kind of useless, we also have people like Todoroki and Bakugo and Deku are established to be incredibly powerful, not even just for high schoolers, but as pro heroes. People who the Pro Hero Association want on the front lines of any battle against supervillains. And this is because of the sheer power of their quirks. However, unfortunately though, Tokuyami, while incredibly powerful, Powerful isn't really in that big three, that Shoto Bakugo Deku big three. But on top of that, he also doesn't really have any arc where he's a main-ish character, like Uchaku or Kirishima or Tenya. And he's not considered best girl like Suyu. In actuality, he gets a similar amount of screen time to characters like Denki, characters who are identified to be useful, but not entertaining enough to take the front stage of the show. But unfortunately, in Tokiyami's case, this is way less than he deserves. Because not only is Tokiyami's power incredibly interesting, but also because he's a heteromorph, he has a unique story to tell. However, when we got the incredibly, let's call it brief moment of, hey, heteromorphs are discriminated in this world, but don't deserve to be in the manga to come up in the anime next season, that was told through the eyes of Shoji, Duple Arms, and Koda, Annie Voice. But they're not the only heteromorphs in the class. In fact, you could say that they're not even the most noticeable heteromorphs in the class. Tokuyami's head is a bird! At least Shoji and Koda have somewhat humanistic heads. But the reason that Tokuyami wasn't there with Shoji and Koda is because Tokuyami is needed on the front lines because for all intents and purposes, he's either the fourth or fifth most powerful person in class 1A. And considering some of the things we've seen in the manga, you could make an argument that he's stronger than Bakugo. Now, he's not stronger than Todoroki, but he's close. With Tokiyami's full release, he's been shown to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of all for what? And not just the old naked mole rat looking all for one, like full perfected body all for one. As Tokiyami has not only became a better understander of Dark Shadow, but also now understands how to better use Dark Shadow. Which means that Tokiyami can envelop himself in as much darkness as possible without fear of Dark Shadow taking over. Which essentially gives Tokiyami a controllable Dark Susano. With so much power that all for one knew that the attack that Tokiyami was flinging at him is something that needed to be dodged. And that Tokiyami with the power of his total release has the ability to hurt all for one. That's crazy, and no one really talks about him. Because for a long time, he existed as the most powerful background character in 1A. The character everyone looked at and went, oh yeah, he's here. Things should be all right. When in actuality, he had more promise than pretty much everyone in 1A outside of Deku and Todoroki. That's nuts. But not as nuts as underestimating the next entry on our list, because coming in at number three, we have Karapika. Once again, Nick, what are you talking about? Karapika's one of the main characters, if not the main character of Hunter Hunter now. Yes, you're right. Karapika is one of the main characters of Hunter Hunter. However, when somebody asks you who are the main characters of Hunter Hunter, do you say Karapika? Probably not. And that's not your fault, and it's not even really Karapika's fault. There's two actual main characters of Hunter Hunter, though. Bigone and Kilua. We all know this. And while Karapika does play a big role in Hunter Hunter, he only plays a big role in parts of Hunter Hunter. Obviously, in the beginning of Hunter Hunter, there's four four main characters, Karapika, Leorio, Kilua, and Go. And the story is about them trying to make their way through the hunter exam and then trying to get Kilua back after he kills a guy in the hunter exam. Well, kills the second guy in the hunter exam. Really had no issue with it when it was a serial killer he killed, but then again, that's understandable. Now, Karapika does take a step back from the spotlight after they get Kilua back, because after Kilua is retrieved by Gon, there's the Heaven's Arena arc, which is just about Kilua and Gon trying to make their way up to the 200th floor of the Heaven's Arena. But Karapika does come back into the story during the York New City auction arc, as Karapika is trying to find the Phantom Troop and the people who have been buying and selling Scarlet Eyes. And thus, in this arc, we are served battles like Karapika versus Ugovin, and just Karapika being a general menace in York New City as a whole. It's also in this arc that we begin to understand what Karapika's Nen ability is, which is his conjured Nen chains. And we see with the power of these chains that Karapika is able to make sure that Krolo is no longer able to use Nen, which is crazy, considering the fact that Krolo is top three, top four strongest people in all of Hunter x Hunter. Now, does this make Karapika top three, top four strongest people in all of Hunter x Hunter? No. In fact, he's not even close to that. But unfortunately, after this battle against Krolo, that's pretty much the last time we see Karapika in the anime, as he's not involved in Greed Island or the Chimera Ant arc. Because while Go and Akilo are messing around in Greed Island and going and battling against the Chimera Ants, Karapika is gathering all of the Scarlet Eyes. And therefore, we are served to one of the coldest images of all time, Karapika hanging up the phone, and it pans out to see all of the Scarlet Eyes behind him. But after the York New City arc, that's 
basically all we get from Kropika. In fact, we get more from Leorio because Leorio is involved in the election arc. And thus Kropika, even though he has some of the coldest moments in the entire anime, is kind of forgotten. And what's wilder about all of that, even though Kropika isn't top three, top four in strength, he is probably the smartest person in the universe outside of the likes of people like Paris Thin or Jing, which is why his role now currently in the manga is so important. In fact, Kropika is now in the manga, the main character, which is crazy and really cool because Kropika, for the entirety of the story, has always had the most compelling story. Kropika has a story very similar to that of Sasuke. However, instead of trying to get back at just Itachi, he's trying to get back at the entire Phantom Troop, which has led Kropika twice now to infiltrating a team of people as a member of security in order to get closer to the Phantom Troop, once in the York New City auction arc and now in the Blackwell arc, or the Succession Contest arc. And while we did get to see a good amount of Kropika's abilities in the York New City arc, we are now currently in the manga truly getting to see the level of genius that Kropika has, and also the level of Nen ability that Kropika has, as his specialist techniques that tie into his crimson eyes are insanely broken. But the thing is, the majority of Hunter x Hunter fans do not read the manga. And while I can't say I necessarily understand this sentiment, I also kind of can. Because here's the thing, Togashi is really good at explaining and building out a universe with no plot holes. But that does require a lot of text. So large swaths of the Hunter x Hunter manga are just walls of text, and therefore getting into the manga can be a bit difficult for a lot of Hunter x Hunter anime only fans. Which is why a vast majority of Hunter x Hunter fans, while they do appreciate Kurapika, do not truly understand how badass this character is, and how he is now very justifiably the main character of Hunter x Hunter. But enough about edgy blondes, let's talk about level-headed blondes, because coming in at number two, we have Riza Hawkeye, also known as Lieutenant. Riza Hawkeye. See, unfortunately, when somebody asks you, who do you think of when you think of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, very few people are going to say Riza Hawkeye. You're going to say Edge. You're going to say Alphonse. You're going to say Colonel Mustang. You even might say Colonel Armstrong. And genuinely, I don't think that's fair because I believe Riza Hawkeye deserves to be in the conversation of greatest characters in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood with all of the people previously listed. See, Riza Hawkeye is essentially Colonel Mustang's bodyguard. She's a sharpshooter and firearms specialist, which in a world of alchemy may not seem as though it's that important, but she definitely makes it worth it. See, Risa to the outside world seems as though she's the perfect soldier. She's courteous, quiet, collected, and always on time. However, the beauty of Risa's character is that there's a vast amount of difference between her outside appearance and her inside feelings. As within the hard carapace that she's built to reject the reality of the military life that she's lived is a soul that understands the burden of heavy loss. Genuinely, the only times that we get a peek behind the curtain on Risa Hawkeye is when she's interacting with younger characters, like the Elric brothers or Winry Rockbell or her dog, Black Hayate. And slowly but surely, we realize that Risa Hawkeye didn't just join the military to crush and kill, but to protect. In fact, she says that she doesn't even like being in the military because sometimes it forces her to kill. In fact, she never takes out her gun unless she intends to shoot it, which shows the way in which Risa Hawkeye views not only guns, but also her abilities with them. And in actuality, the real reason that she likes guns is because unlike swords and knives, you don't have to feel your opponent die. Now, her name Hawkeye came from the Zhvalin Civil War, where she was known as one of the greatest snipers in the Amestrian army. And through years of battle prowess and experience, Riza Hawkeye really does have a Hawkeye. Like in the moment when Riza was walking down the tunnels with Envy, who was disguised as Colonel Mustang, Riza lifts her gun and points it at Colonel Mustang's head and states that when we're alone, Colonel Mustang calls me by my first name, Riza, which in actuality he doesn't do. But Riza Hawkeye deduced that Envy would fall for this and Colonel Mustang would just be confused. And thus Envy sheds the skin of Colonel Mustang and jumps away. To which Riza says, you fell for it and shoots her in the forehead. See Riza with no alchemical ability whatsoever, still manages to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the most powerful homunculi. And while sure, technically Envy is cleaned up by Colonel Mustang, the fact that Riza was able to deduce that Colonel Mustang was not in fact Colonel Mustang and instead Envy and also defend herself in that moment, not only speaks to the level of experience and badassery that was Riza Hawkeye, but also speaks to just truly how well she understood the person she spent every day with, Colonel Mustang. And not to mention, since we're talking about Colonel Mustang, let's not forget that Riza Hawkeye is more often than not a moral compass for him, as Colonel Mustang would often get caught up in the throes of combat and lose himself. And without Riza Hawkeye to snap him out of that, there's really genuinely no telling what depths of the despair he would have sunken down into. And because Riza and Colonel Mustang's lives have been so intertwined for so long, Riza commits herself wholly to making sure that she can follow him wherever he goes. And not only just following him, but also supporting him in all endeavors that they might undergo. She's not only the symbol of loyalty, but also powerful in a way unique to herself in a universe heavily dependent on magic, while also perfectly depicting the fact that women can either be silent and 
stoic or loving and caring or both. As a maintenance of both of these feelings is not only realistic, but necessary. She's an incredible character, and I think she deserves more love from the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood fandom. But not as much love as our number one spot needs, because coming in at number one, we have Sakura. But Nick, what do you mean? Sakura came in third in our top 99. How could she be underrated? Yes, it is absolutely true that the tides are shifting on all things Sakura. A character who was once universally memed and made fun of by the entirety of anime, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you watched your content, has now become one of the most beloved characters in all of Naruto. But why did this happen? And why do I believe that she's the number one most underrated character in all of anime? Well, to be genuinely real with you, in the early days of my Naruto fandom, when I was young and dumb, I also made jokes about the pink trash can. But when you genuinely begin to appreciate and understand the undertones of the story of Naruto, you begin to realize that Sakura achieved more than Sasuke and Naruto combined. I know that sounds like an absolutely asinine thing to say, but stick with me here. In the beginning of Naruto, it was very clear that Sakura did not deserve to be in Team 7. Naruto had the nine-tailed fox, Sasuke had the Sharingan, and Sakura had a kunai and a haircut. However, as time progresses and we hit the time skip and go to Shippuden, we realize that Sakura has begun to close the gap little by little. And whether that be through training her physical strength or training in medical ninjutsu with Tsunade, Sakura was getting stronger. Until eventually when Team 7 came all back together and used their three-way deadlock, it was revealed that Sakura believed that with the strength of the Byakuya seal that she had achieved a level of strength comparable to Naruto and Sasuke. And for all intents and purposes, she was close, probably about as close as she would ever get. Except for now, currently in the Boruto manga, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But the thing is, about all of this. Naruto is half Uzumaki and probably half Senju because Minato is probably a Senju. Sasuke is a full-blooded Uchiha and both Naruto and Sasuke are reincarnations of Ashura and Indra who are literal gods and progenitors of some of the strongest clans on earth. Not to mention that, but also when the fighting gets really rough in the fourth great shinobi world war, Hagoromo, the literal god of the universe, comes down and gives a power up to Naruto and Sasuke. So any power that Sakura had accrued in order to close the distance between Naruto and Sasuke was now kind of irrelevant because the Sky Daddy conveniently forgot to give her anything, which was annoying. But you know what? That didn't stop Sakura, as Sakura went on to battle against the same enemies as Naruto and Sasuke, like Madara and Kaguya. In fact, heading into the battle against Kaguya, Sakura is the only person who doesn't have Sage of Six Pass Chakra, because Kakashi gets Obitos, meaning that Sakura, who landed a blow against Kaguya, mind you, went into the battle against Kaguya, the only person without an upgrade from some higher entity, meaning Sakura was the only person battling against Kaguya on the back of hard work and hard work alone. And sure, in that battle, was Sakura probably the weakest person? Yeah, but if Hamura had descended down from the Pure Lands or some other godlike entity had decided to give her an upgrade, she probably would have been equally strong. However, my Sashi Kishimoto does not care about her. And while we as a fan base have acknowledged this and still decided to love her and acknowledge her accomplishments, and even now in Boruto, we've actually gotten a couple of really cool moments from her, like in Sasuke Retsudon or her light novel or in her battle against Shin, where she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody who was probably an alive Madara level threat. Recent events have made me realize that we as a fan base and more my Sashi Kishimoto Kishimoto as a person vastly underestimate Sakura. That is to say that my Sashi Kishimoto has forgotten about her entirely. See, here's the thing. Two Blue Vortex's first chapter came out, Borto Shippuden. And in this new chapter, it was revealed that Shikamaru is now the eighth Hokage, which is fine. Unless, of course, you acknowledge the fact that Shikamaru is by far and away not the strongest person in Konoha, and the strongest person in Konoha is supposed to become the Hokage, and therefore the only two logical choices for the eighth Hokage would either be Kakashi or Sakura. But not only have we not seen Sakura since chapter 50-ish, I believe, we're completely ignoring the fact that Sakura would have been massively helpful in the battle against Ishiki, as she has speed comparable to that of Naruto and Sasuke during the war arc, and probably greater than that considering the fact that she trained during the blank period, and as an entirely taijutsu stamina and durability based kit all things that Ishiki wouldn't be able to battle against but instead of going off to battle against Ishiki with Naruto and Sasuke she stays behind so that she can heal them when they come back because her going and possibly using a Lady Katsuyo summoning wouldn't have been massively helpful in the battle against Ishiki it's not like Lady Katsuyo is a physical entity with the ability to heal anybody it's attached to while also being summoned by a person whose speed and strength is either comparable to or greater than Sasuke and Naruto's so not only is she not involved in some of the most important fights like Ishiki and Momoshiki but she's also not in consideration to become the 8th Okage and is also just gone from the story entirely. Which is wild when you consider the fact that Sarada is down a parent because Sasuke is now a rogue ninja. So you would assume that Sakura, now the strongest member of the Konoha 12, still existing within Konoha and probably the strongest person in the village outside of Kakashi, and she still may be stronger than him, would take a big step forward in terms of importance. Nope. 
gone. We're forgetting about her, whatever. She'll come back in a couple of chapters to heal somebody apparently more important than her. And that, that alone is why Sakura is our number one spot. What do you guys think? If you had to build the top 10 of underrated characters in anime, who would you put on that list? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Nick tries to not yell about Sakura's lack of importance in Naruto slash Boruto challenge difficulty. Impossible.